In this study, we will be continuing our study of Jeremiah chapter 3. Between verse 21, which follows, and the end of the chapter, we're going to see kind of a conversation going on. First of all, God has, uh, has uh, uh, said, Ye have, have dealt treacherously with me. It's, that's the indictment. And then God is indicating, but there is weeping in the congregation. And now comes God with his, with his statement of mercy. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. This statement is emphasizing, and there are many, many like this, are, is emphasizing the consuming mercy of God. Just as in verse 22, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Here we read in verse 23, truly, in the Lord our God, in, in, in Christ our God, in our Savior our God, is the salvation of Israel. We, we know that that is the only place we should go. Now bear in mind, this, this conversation, these statements are not made from the, uh, from the uh, rank and file of the churches and congregations. These are those who weep and mourn because of the, of the abominable things the church is doing. Remember from Ezekiel chapter 9, the ones who had the mark on their forehead, who were not subject to being, being slain. How many people are really weeping and mourning because the, the church has been trusting too much in, uh, in the church doctrines rather than in the Bible? How many are really upset and disturbed and, and uh, asking for an answer from their pastors? How come we teach these things that are contrary to the Word of God? Remember the joy that came to those who remained when the two witnesses were killed? Because now these two witnesses who tormented them. The Bible is a torment, you know. I don't care if you are an unbeliever. The Bible is still a torment. But it won't go away. You have to read the Bible. Read the Bible. And that's the only way we can come to Christ. Well, now this same, same person, these true believers, who are weeping and supplicating before God, who are mourning because of the wickedness that's going on in the high places, as indicated in verse 24, For shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. One of the most dis disturbing things that I have seen in the church, and I've been in it long enough, I've been I've born and raised in the church and have been there for so many years, is as I watch the children and they grow up. And oh, they're lovely when they're little children. And then they finally become teenagers and they make confession of faith, many of them because they have come from uh, parents who are members of the church and then they become members, maybe. And, but uh, many of them, many of them disappear. They have no interest in the church. The flocks and the herds are devoured. The sons and the daughters are dead. It's the moment that you begin to seriously talk to a great many people in churches and congregations who are confessing members, who are in, in a fine, uh, fine relationship with that church, and yet you start talking to them seriously about the Bible, and the conversation doesn't go long at all. They just don't, they're not interested in talking to them. It isn't that they're introverts, because the next thing, turn the subject around and start talking about your business or talk about the world economy or the baseball game, and suddenly you'll have a very vivacious and, and excited conversation going on. But talk about the Bible, and then suddenly 
is very, very difficult. Like my friend, when I asked him to start reading the Bible, reading the Bible, and then the, the silence became very long because I, I just don't want to do that is really what is being conveyed. Well, now this same individual, the believers are saying, in, as they are responding to the indictment of God, for shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers. Now, shame is to bring dishonor. If we're shame, ashamed of something, we feel that we have uh, dishonored the cause, we've dishonored our family, we've dishonored, uh, have uh, brought, brought a bad reputation on it, and this is exactly what has happened in the churches. The churches have become an area of shame, of shame, where there ought to be a, a real desire to search the Word of God, where there ought to be a real welcome to those who are particularly concerned about this doctrine or that doctrine. But no, it's a shame. It's a shame. The church has brought dishonor upon, upon itself. It has become the work of men. It has been the, the men within it who have been taking the attitude that we have spiritual authority. And without realizing it, they're saying, we really don't need God. We have it all worked out. You do this, and you do that, and you do the other thing. And you're going to see a lot of people making... Uh, becoming members of this church. And uh, haven't we accomplished something? Why, well, look at our congregation. We got 2,000 members, 29,000 members. My, my, you can't fault that, can you? There must be something good going on. Yeah, well, it's not the, God, it's not the salvation of the Bible at all. And so there has been brought shame, dishonor, disrepute, upon those within the congregation and we lie in our shame our confusion covereth us for we have sinned against our god oh wouldn't it be wonderful if that was the conclusion of church after church and congregation after congregation we have sinned and the congregation comes together and they be, are weeping and mourning. We have sinned. We have sinned. We see a little of that in the book of Ezra and, uh, and the book of Nehemiah when they came together and they were weeping and weeping because they recognized sins that they had gotten into as a congregation. Uh, but today, today, no, we assemble together. It's a celebration. It's a celebration of how great God is. And look what he's doing for us. Why, look at that new auditorium we just built. Look at that bowling alley that we're able to put into our facilities. Look at the number, the great number of people who have just joined and so on. There is joy, there is no shame. And, uh, and yet here is the, here is the, uh, uh, the, in, in the statement of the true believer, we lie down in our shame and our confusion covereth us. We lie down. That's an impl implication. We're on our way down. We're under the wrath of God. And we, we have sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers for, from our youth even unto this day and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God. Now that's as plain a statement as anybody can make. This is what sin is. This is what has brought the wrath of God upon the churches and congregations. They have not obeyed the Lord. They have gone down, down. And finally the wrath of God is upon them. And uh, it's... Uh, it's, uh, it has brought them into this terrible situation of judgment. Now, we go on to chapter 4, and the conversation continues. Now, remember, in verse 20 of chapter 3, God has made an indictment. Uh, uh, you have dealt treacherous with me. And then, beginning in verse 21, we uh, find that there is... There are the true believers that are weeping and, and supplicating. 
uh, because they recognize what has happened. Then once more there is the plea, verse 22, Return, ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. And then came these who were weeping and supplicating, and they are saying, We come unto thee, for our, thou art Je Jehovah our God. And of course, this if we look at this in the in the, ex, in the whole picture, to come unto thee, it means they are coming out of the churches because that is what God's command is, to come out. Now we come down to verse 1 of chapter 4, and God again is speaking. Again, he is making a plea. He again is repeating what we've already read in Jeremiah 18. If I have I have planned uh, uh, judgment or spoken of judgment, if you return, I will void that and I will bless you. Well, here he says, if thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight, then shalt thou not remove. In other words, then you will not be, uh, you will not be driven away from the churches and congregations if you will return. Now remember, he's not talking to, to uh, individuals uh, uh, who are true believers. They, they have never departed from God. They are always faithful because they have received a new resurrected soul in which they're faithful. God here is speaking to the whole congregation, the whole congregation. If thou wilt put away your abominations. Now, it's a, it's a, it's, it's like God is speaking to the wind. It, because they're not going to put away their abomination. But yet, it is a, an honest statement of God. Oh, do I have to say honest? <laughs> Everything about God is perfectly honest. I have to say that because so often we make statements that are not honest. We make we make promises, and we don't really mean those promises. But God always keeps his promises, always makes them. And here is a statement of God, if you will, if you will. And yet, because God knows the end from the beginning, as we go on in Jeremiah, we're going to find in a, in a little while, we're going to find, don't even pray for the churches anymore. Don't even pray for them, because they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. And yet, here is the principle. If you will do it, if you will turn, it's, it's again underscoring the immense patience of God, the immense uh, uh, long-suffering of God, and the fact that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. If you will put away thine abominations, that is, if you will turn to Jehovah your God, to Christ as your Savior and Him alone, and get rid of these cra crazy notions that you can make some kind of a contribution to your salvation, or you can guarantee it, or you can get saved tonight, or, or and these uh, these uh, things that you're doing with my Sabbath day and and uh, with what you're doing with the marriage institution that I have established, get uh, get rid of all those things and turn unto me. You know, if this were way off in the wild blue yonder in the future, we'd say, I wonder if the churches at that time in the future, when all this is going to happen, I wonder, is it possible that they might return to the Lord, that they might see their sin? But we live in that terrible time where we're right in it. We're living in the time when this message is for now, right now. And we can ask the question. Now, here is the plaintiff. Here is the beseeching uh, question. Return unto me, and I will pardon you, effectively, God is saying. And I will not remove you. And we look all over. And most of us happen to be more acquainted with the central core of the evangelical community. If we were out there in some uh, wild-eyed uh, uh, 
sect or cult of some kind and really weren't a, uh, acquainted with the, with the real evangelical community, the real conservatives in the Bible, we'd have to say, well, certainly in our, in our understanding, in the sect that we belong to or the group we belong to, there's not going to be any turning. We know we're doing what we're supposed to do and we believe we have it right and and if you want to measure us against the Bible and tell us that we're a thousand miles away so be it but we're not going to change but maybe out there we're the long-haired conservatives who are carrying their Bible to church and and uh, they're still uh, making confession of faith and so on and where they have solemn assembly they're not, they haven't started dancing in the aisles yet uh, and so on, uh, maybe they will turn. But we happen to come, most of us come from that very area of the church, the central core of the evangelicals. And what do we see amongst our friends and our loved ones who are still there and, our, and, and those that we know about? We don't see any movement. We don't see any movement by whole congregations. We have to change. We have, we have to be uh, weeping before the Lord. We have sinned. We have sinned. We have sinned. There is no movement. And so as God is, is once more beseeching, we have to say, it's fruitless. It's fruitless. It, the churches aren't hearing. They're not turning. They're not turning. And, and, and of course, it's not just that they that they put away their abominations. But look at verse 2. And thou shalt swear the Lord liveth in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. This is the way it ought to be. This is the way it ought to be. That we recognize that it is Christ who lives. Uh, that he is the way, the truth, and the light that he is the one who is the judge of all the earth and comes with his laws that are judgments. He is the one who is altogether righteous. And, and if only the churches would do that, then through the churches, the nations would begin to bless the Lord because uh, they are looking to the churches for their guidance. Oh my, I remember I was on an airplane one time and this was years and years ago, and we were going through a very severe lightning storm and, and, uh, and uh, preparing to land in Chicago. And then the uh, pilot couldn't get his landing gear down right away, and he was struggling with it, and he announced, you know, we're going to have to go around until I can get this worked out. There happened to be two nuns aboard, and uh, everybody could know they were nuns, and because they had the habit, the uh, dress of a nun. And it was curious how everybody was looking at those nuns to pray, pray. They had the inside track to God, you see. They represented the church, and somehow they could get us out of that pickle, out of that predicament. Well, to make a long story short, I'm still here, so the <laughs> plane landed safely because of... <laughs> It, uh, they finally got the landing wheels down and we did land. But it was, it was a really an object lesson how the world itself, the world itself still looks to those who claim to be religious as if they have some kind of an inside tract with God, uh, a, a pipeline to God. But the fact is, only if we're true believers, only if we're true believers and we're doing it God's way, then uh, the nations can look to us for guidance and because then we have we are coming with the word of God. Well, in our next study, we're going to go on and look at verse 3 where it talks about breaking up your fallow ground. What kind of ground is that?